Hi everybody, it's Mr. Stevens here. We are going to jump right back into Brothers in Arms, The Lives and Experiences of the Men Who Fought the Civil War in Their Own Words by William C. Davis. Uh, we'll pick up right where we left off in the last video. I hope you guys are still enjoying it. I know I am. And away we go. Part of the drill and discipline was to prepare the volunteers for handling the deadly weapons entrusted to them. Infantry men got muskets or rifles with bayonets, while a cavalry man got a carbine, usually a pistol, and a saber as well. All could and did kill and were as deadly to friend as foe if not properly used. The edged weapons soon proved next to useless. Horsemen usually did more damage to themselves and their animals with their swords than to any enemy, while foot soldiers soon found the best use for their bayonets to be as candlesticks and meat spits. In the whole war, they inflicted less than half of 1% of all wounds. It was the firearms, and especially the rifles, that took the toll, and then, thanks chiefly to the volume of fire rather than the accuracy, Reb and Yank never became any better marksmen than they were soldiers. If all men shoot at the enemy like they did at that barrel, they will not kill very many of the enemy unless they climb like squirrels or get in the ground like moles. For those that did not hit the treetop, hit the ground about halfway to the target. Jesse W. Reed, 4th South Carolina Infantry, CSA. Just a few of the many experimental breech-loading weapons tried during the war, including, at top, the Burnside Carbon, invented by General Ambrose Burnside, the very effective seven-shot Spencer repeating carbon, and at the bottom, the less successful Smith Carbine. Each carbine seemed to require its special ammunition, which made supply a problem. Cartridges for Merrill's carbine came in these packets. Well-armed Yankee cavalrymen carried sabers, pistols, and short-barreled carbines that were presumably easier to use from horseback. In fact, cavalrymen almost always fought dismounted. The exhaustingly full day of the new volunteer also served to keep him too busy to fall prey to every soldier's enemy, homesickness. It could, quite literally, kill. Those in its clutches fell into despondency, lost appetite, and thus weakened in con constitution were easy prey for other camp diseases. Every letter from home only made more stark the difference between sleeping in a rude tent surrounded by strangers and being at home amid the friends and relatives of a lifetime. Word of some tragedy at home made the miles of separation seem longer. Glad tidings made more cruel the fact that the soldiers missed the happy event. More men die of homesickness than all other diseases, one Iowa man claimed with some exaggeration, and when a man gives up and lies down, he is a goner. If I had been suddenly thrown from the comforts of home and the scenes of prosperity around me into such a place as this, I should have thought it horrible, very horrible, but we have become used to it. We are as cheerful and as happy as you are. Only when we think of home, then oh how our heart sickens. Alfred L. Ho, Pennsylvania Infantry, USA. A soldier fought homesickness as he could, carrying these images of his loved ones made him feel at least a little closer to the people on the images. Most men kept in touch with home and hearth as they did, as did this soldier of the Confederate 5th Georgia, by writing letters. Just a sampling of the literally millions of soldier letters written during the war, many of them on patriotic stationery proclaiming confidence in country and cause. Christopher Dimmick has dead. That makes three of the Dover boys that has died out of 42 and one killed. That is about the way there is more dies by sickness than getting killed. Andrew K. Rose, Ohio Infantry, USA. 
Private Rose was closer to the truth than he knew. More than 600,000 men died in the war, and more than three-fourths of them succumbed to disease. Suddenly, in 1861, boys and men who lived isolated lives and had never been exposed to large numbers of people were thrown into the company of tens of thousands. Simple childhood diseases like measles and chickenpox ravaged through the camps. Measles alone killed tens of thousands. Worse, doctors examined and passed untold numbers of men too ill to serve, who then went on to infect others. And on top of that, there were no medicines other than purgatives, no anesthetics other than ether and opiates, and not even a concept of sanitation. As a result, the war was a carnival for microbes. Simple wounds became gangrenous, resulting in amputation or death. A white soldier could expect to be sick at least two and a half times a year, and a black soldier three and a half times. A bullet would kill six soldiers out of a hundred. Disease would claim more than sixteen. A soldier's nightmare was being wounded and coming under the care of a surgeon, who no matter how conscientious, was still groping blindly in search of healing. All too often, his only weapon against infection and death was the scalpel and the saw. This soldier's misery started as an injury to the ankle, but gangrene has set in. The foot has become hideously disfigured and infected and will be amputated. The uniform and instruments of the Confederate surgeon. He was nearly as well equipped as his Yankee counterpart, except for medications. Thankfully, there was usually enough opiate anesthetics for his operations. Chapter 3. Life in Camp The recruits went to the armies besotted with the idea that being a soldier would be nothing but fighting and glory. They had no notion of such a thing as camping half a year at a time on some muddy or frozen plain, occupied with nothing more than marching and countermarching. Moreover, no one taught them to cook or pitch tents or not to dig their latrines upstream from the camp. Most of all, no one taught them how to handle the incalculable hours they found on their hands after those initial weeks of drill were done, and when they were not actually on campaign. It was a seemingly endless routine of awake, clean camp, eat, drill and detail work, another meal, mending uniforms, cleaning weapons, and always an incessant talk of battles won and lost, of home and family, and of hope for the future. Let us together recall with pleasure the past. Once more be hungry and eat, once more tired and rest, once more thirsty and drink, once more cold and wet, let us sit by the roaring fire and feel comfort creep over us. Carlton McCarthy, Richmond Howitzers, CSA. In the soldier's monotonous life, no time was more important than meals. These are the items that he used to prepare and eat his food, from the conical Sibley stove to the coffee boiler and mess kits, the plate holds a piece of hard tack. For every hour in battle, the soldiers spent weeks, even months, in routine camp chores, cutting wood, washing clothes, and more. A fortunate few had wives who followed the armies and helped. In cold or rainy weather, when every opening is closed, they are most unwholesome tenements, and to enter one of them on a rainy morning from the outer air and encounter the night's accumulation of nauseating exhalations from the bodies of twelve men, differing widely in their habits of personal cleanliness, was an experience which no old soldier has ever been known to recall with any great enthusiasm. John D. Billings, 10th Massachusetts Artillery, USA not surprisingly, shelter was very important to the soldier, even if it was a stinking Sibley tent like the one Billings described. In summer and fall, a tent was his only protection from rain and sun, and winter and spring, the log and canvas houses, built for winter quarters, kept out some of the icy blasts. Tents came in every shape, from the two-man dog tent to the huge wall tents that accommodated up to twenty. Most were cumbersome to handle, and afforded, at best, minimal comfort. The more imaginative and substantial winter housing, on the other hand, could include fireplaces and even board floors. Even then, soldiers showed their attitude toward the shelter by dubbing their dwellings Swine Hotel, Starvation Alley, and Mud Lane. 
The proud pennant of a Yankee regiment that saw action in every major battle in the East. The emblem in the center is that of the 5th Corps, Army of the Potomac. A large Union winter quarters in Virginia shows the substantial huts and houses built by some regiments. Virtual log cities with named streets and even sidewalks sometimes appeared in the countryside. The soldiers could be living there for months. Around the ruins of a burned house, soldiers have erected their shelters and temporary stockades as the army passes. The high-crowned hardy hat, with the insignia of the engineers, overlooks a forage kepi marked with regiment's number and company letters. The soldier who expected his army rations to provide any diversion from monotony was soon disappointed. His meat came either salted, pickled, or so freshly killed that he could still taste the blood in it. Even the preserved meat was sometimes so spoiled it looked blue and would stick like glue when thrown against a tree. Bread could be baked fresh daily when in winter camp, but on the march the men ate army bread, a tough tooth-cracking cracker called hardtack, but more often known as sheet iron crackers, tooth dullers, and worm castles, thanks to their being inhabited by maggots. Vegetables, when they got them, came raw from the fields or desiccated, dehydrated, and pressed into cakes. Hardly any of it was nourishing, and much of it was disgusting. Soldiers held mock funerals for their beef rations, claimed mystical properties for the rock-hard crackers, and undermined their health by frying all of it in a sea of grease. Yesterday morning was the first time we had to carry our meat for the maggots always carried it till then. We had to have an extra guard to keep them from packing it clear off. Charles Anderson, Ohio Infantry, USA. Whenever the army stopped in one place long enough, the commissaries began baking fresh bread to supplement the hardtack issue. Amongst the filth of camp, dough rises in pans in the sun while a baker needs more than the trough. A soldier tends a meal frying in the ubiquitous grease over a small portable tin stove, while comrades in the winterized Sibley tents do the same. Cooking utensils were usually little more than a skillet and a few bowls, with dinnerware inevitably of tin. Many soldiers carried combination cutlery of the type seen here. Not only camp cooking worked against the health of the soldier when not on campaign, he dug his latrines in the wrong places and then, often as not, just answered nature's call whenever he felt like it. Even outside the flap of his tent, camp garbage and especially the carcasses of butchered livestock attracted legions of flies. Required by regulations to bathe once a week, many soldiers never washed for the entire war except dunkings when they crossed streams on the march. Then there were the vermin. Fleas, lice, flies, mosquitoes, and more banqueted on Johnny Reb and Billy Yank. Calling lice graybacks, the soldiers made a sport of hunting them in each other's hair and clothing, and some swore that dead lice were found with the letters IFW, in for the war, on their backs. Another soldier tried killing them, but as I believe 40 of them comes to everyone's funeral, I have given it up as a bad job. I have seen men literally wear out their underclothes without a change, and when they threw them off, they would swarm with vermin like a live anthill when disturbed. Cyrus F. Boyd, 15th Iowa Infantry, USA. Concepts of cleanliness were lax in the extreme, and sanitation barely existed in the camps. With time on their hands in winter huts like these, men washed their clothing more often, but they could never rid themselves of the ever-present lice. Many a soldier rarely, if ever, bathed himself, and when he did, it was usually in temperate weather when a convenient stream offered a cooling dip. Men who neglected the basics of cleanliness sooner or later had need of the surgeon. And we will stop there for the day. I uh, hope you guys are still enjoying this uh, book. I know that I am. Uh, we will get the next part up ASAP, and we will see you soon. Thanks, guys. Have a good day.